So that's Trisha Goddard at the top of the hour and once again produced by Sarah Devine and my assistant producer Finley Knowles tucked away there in the corner. Good, reliable, solid tech op Dave Rhodes and supported by uh, Mosique Lavontel on visuals, video editor Parik Thompson and of Thomas, sorry, and of course our superb weekend editor Phil Dave. Uh, it's been a fabulous weekend. Thank you all for joining me and sharing your opinions. We didn't all agree, but we certainly explored the subjects with great quality and with great depth. And for that, I am extremely grateful as ever for your time and engaging and making this such a good show. Shall we do it all again next week? Shall we say one o'clock? This is Talk TV. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello and welcome to a really packed Sunday show. So glad to have you with us. Um, today, I guess the big headline is that we're talking to Julian Assange's wife. Stella Assange has made time to talk to us in light of the judgment uh, that was made this week uh, by the High Court saying that Julian Assange can contest America's uh, uh, wanting to extradite him to the USA. Uh, they're asking, um, will he face the death penalty? But uh, as I said, we are lucky enough to have Stella Assange join us. What else is on the show? Well, today is World Health Day. Um, how's your health? You know, that's a really good question because I was having a bit of a Google and it said almost half of the UK population, 45.7% of men, 50.1% of women, uh, have reported having a long-standing health problem. More women reported to uh, being limited, but not severely, in activities because of a health problem in the last six months than men. Uh, that was 18.5. So do you think that Britain is facing a health crisis? I mean, the people you know around you, do you know more unwell people than well people? interesting one isn't it anyway we're going to be talking about that because it's world health day um we also have our wonderful health panel got a great health panel for you the two things we're looking at is tomorrow the comet will be coming over the the usa now republican uh, representative marjorie taylor green believes that it's a sign from god that people need to repent so that's what I'm going to be talking to my faith panel about. Um, do you believe that the comet is a sign from God? And uh, President Trump, ex-President Trump, is selling his version of the Bible. He's not the only leader or would-be leader to use religion to get re-elected or to stay in power. In fact, it's happened in India uh, with Nahendra Modri, and it's also happened with Putin using orthodoxy there to stay in power. So we're going to be talking to our faith panel about that. Also, big booming business, fertilizing women's eggs. Uh, apparently, it's really taking off. It costs an absolute fortune to do, but how successful is it? All that and a lot, lot more. Plus, of course, I guess the headline, well, it is the headline today. Um, it's six months since the atrocity of October the 7th happened uh, in Israel. Um, Israel Hamas war, if you call it that, it's day 184. Um, there have been protests against the government held across Israel on Saturday night. Five protesters were run over by a driver who refused to obey police in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, as I said before, six months have now passed since October the 7th. 133 of the 253 civilians and soldiers uh, abducted by Hamas remain in Gaza. So there's a lot going on. Um, amongst all of this, though, what uh, there's two points of view that I'm going to be looking at. Uh, a major poll has indicated that the majority of voters in the UK now back banning the sale of arms to Israel. This is a YouGov poll. Uh, and it seems to have really come about uh, despite tens of thousands of Pal Palestinians being killed, it appears that it is the deaths of British, Polish, Canadian and Australian aid workers that have led to a kind of a dam bursting for Western powers. Um, we're going to be looking at this from two points of view. In a little bit, a little bit later, we're going to be crossing live to Israel to talk to a reporter there. But I um, want to start off by talking to Yasmin Ahmed, who is UK Director of Human Rights Watch, and she joins me now. Yasmin, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, 
lots happening, lots happening there. Let's talk about human rights and the rights of uh, the uh, people in Gaza, the Palestinians at the moment. Six months on, there's so much happening. It's not all cut and dried. I've been reading report after report. It does seem that even within Israel, they have recognized that Israel, the tide is kind of turning. People are starting to say enough is enough after these aid uh, aid workers were killed, despite the hundreds of thousands, you know, the thousands of Palestinians that have been killed. Um, from your point of view, what are the main issues today, six months on? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Um, the, the key issues for uh, from Human Rights Watch's perspective is that Israel is committing crimes against humanity and war crimes in Gaza now. Um, we were very clear, and, and, and this was months ago, in fact, that, that, that Israel is using starvation as a method of war, as a, as a punishment, a collective punishment against all of the Palestinian people. We know there are now an alarming, alarming, rates of uh, people who have insufficient food and such real risk of starvation for the people of Gaza. We know essentially that Gaza is likely to be starving and people will die as a result. We know that it has been reported that the UN have said at least 20 people have died of starvation already. We also know that there have been war crimes, apparent war crimes and other uh, serious violations of international humanitarian law that have been committed by Israel in the attacks on the people in Gaza now. So we are very, very concerned that this continues. But in, in addition to what Israel is doing and calling on Israel to comply with international law, it is critical that third states like the United Kingdom both call out Israel and call them out for not only their failure to comply with international law, but also their failure to comply with the International Court of Justice's provisional measures. And also that they should not be complicit in what is happening there today and has been happening. And that is where the arms sales comes in because we've been very clear that there's a risk, there's a very serious risk. Um, and in fact, the UK government's in breach of its own law by continuing to provide arms to Israel. And uh, I just want to add there, according to the United Nations, in a resolution that just uh, adopted it by 28 votes in favour, six against, 13 abstentions, uh, the Human Rights Council, uh, Council backed a call to cease the sale, transfer and diversion of arms, munition and other military equipment to Israel, the occupying power, to prevent further violations of international humanitarian law and violations and abuses of human rights. Uh, I just want to play a clip of Lord Cameron talking about British aid workers. Uh, here it is. Uh, the dreadful events of the last two days are a moment when we should mourn the loss of these brave humanitarian workers, including the three British citizens that tragically uh, were killed. We should also send our condolences uh, to their families and our thoughts should be with them. Uh, I welcome what the Israeli foreign minister said yesterday to me about a full urgent and transparent inquiry into how this dreadful event was allowed to happen. And we want to see that happen very, very quickly. I also welcome the fact that he spoke about much more aid getting into Gaza, up to 500 trucks a day. That is essential. We've been promised these things before, and this really needs to happen, including longer opening times at the vital crossing points. But of course, the extra aid won't work unless there is proper deconfliction, unless aid can be taken around around Gaza and we avoid the dreadful incidents like we see, we've seen in the last couple of days. That is vital. Yes, I mean, your, your feelings about what Lord Cameron said that uh, just there. Well, I think, first of all, it must be noted that condolences and words of sorrow are just not enough, particularly when the UK government continues to arm Israel. We are licensing 
the military equipment, 20% uh, of the F-35 uh, fighter jets, which are certainly being used in Gaza at this time, come and are produced in the United Kingdom and are licensed by the UK government. There are very serious questions about whether there were, in fact, components in the drone that was used to kill three British nationals, whether they, in fact, came from a, a company in the UK. The fact that he can stand up now and still talk about condolences when we, as the United Kingdom are providing weaponry that are being that is potentially and very likely being used in Gaza to commit very serious violations of international law, if not apparent war crimes, then is just uh, it's it blows my mind that that can continue to be the UK government's position. And as you quite rightly noted, the UN Human Rights Council came out this week and was very clear that states should end the export of arms and military equipment to Israel now, given the violations that are ongoing and the crimes that we are seeing committed. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, AI military use, the resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council also denounced the use of artificial intelligence to aid military decision making in conflict that may contribute to international crimes. Um, it decries the targeting of civilians, including on the 7th of October 2023. So for people who say, oh, the Human Rights Council is only about Palestinians, no, it demands the immediate release of all remaining hostages persons arbitrarily detained and victims of enforced disappearance, as well as ensuring immediate humanitarian access to the hostages and detainees in line with international law. What do they mean when they talk about victims of enforced disappearance? Well, there is very serious questions and um, investigations that are ongoing now and certainly reports of persons from Gaza who have been detained and those individuals who have been detained, there are questions about whether in fact those people have, where, where they've been detained, uh, whether in fact we, we, we are, are hearing reports that those individuals have no access to uh, lawyers, to um, anyone externally, um, very serious questions about whether they've been in fact charged with anything. Um, so there are very, very serious questions about um, individuals from Gaza who have potentially been detained and where, how and in what circumstances they have been detained. And obviously this is this sits against a context where Israel has in fact detained people under administrative detention unlawfully for many, many decades in the West Bank um, and, and also in Gaza. And so this is certainly not, this sits against a backdrop of serious, serious, serious violations which have been happening against Against the Palestinian people for decades, including um, the commission of the crime against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Uh, just uh, to update with uh, recent news, um, the UK Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden has suggested the UK would stop arms sales to Israel if it was found to be in breach of international law. Um, one wonders uh, uh, who he would listen to uh, uh, on that ruling, because as you say, the human rights, uh, you know, has has Israel been charged with breaking, in, you know, breaching international law? Well, I mean, it's very clear the UN, um, UN uh, uh, representatives, uh, multiple NGOs who are documenting this, including Human Rights Watch, have been very, very clear that that Israel has violated international law. I mean, if you if you are saying that as an occupying power, it's lawful to stop food, water, electricity, you know, basic humanitarian goods into Gaza for six months other than a trickle and for people to, to effectively starve a population. If you're saying that that's lawful, I don't know what law book or what law you are looking at. Mm -hmm. So one wonders where he would need this information to come from to yeah. actually listen to it. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the other interesting thing, I was reading a piece by Anshul Pfeffer, um, who's based in Jerusalem, writes for the Times. He's, he's, he is really brilliant. Um, 
one of the things he's interested he, he talks about is the propaganda war and he writes and i quote in the space of six months israel has gone from having the sympathy of the world to having its closest ally threatened to turn away from it um, last week of course president biden warned that american policy would change if israel did not immediately do more to alleviate the humanitarian crisis and minimize civilian casualties in gaza um, Yasmin, I don't know what better way to to what other way to put this. And I was we were talking about this yesterday with the aid workers and reading out their names. Uh, and indeed, I, I reiterated that today. Uh, third, over 30,000, 33,000 um, is the count of uh, Gazan people who've been killed, 70% of them being women and children. And yet it's those seven aid workers uh, to, who, you know, Lord Cameron uh, extended his condolences, as do we all. But it, it seems like it took Western aid workers to be killed in this way for so many people people so many leaders in position to actually start speaking out yeah well yes I mean I, I I couldn't say it better myself that's absolutely right we've seen nearly six months of um you know uh, un apparently unlawful or certainly unlawful attacks we've seen you know apparent war crimes being committed gaza now starving um you know children palestinian children already dead from malnourishment and as you said it seems that it's taken western aid workers who you know obviously we all we are all devastated by that loss and in fact as a as a community of ngos have been very clear that this is like to happen and has been happening. In fact, these are not first aid workers. There have been aid workers from, from the UN and other organisations that have been killed. 200, but 200, the count so far is 200 aid workers and somewhere in the region of 100 journalists. And as you said, but the difference is now that those are not, those are not you know, they, they, those are Palestinian lives. Uh, they're not Western lives. And, and as you said, it's very, very upsetting to think that and, and 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 in fact quite shameful to think that it is the lives of western people that have taken you, you know the countries to actually speak up and we know also that for all these you know for all these uh um months or western states have been saying they've been doing everything they can but we know that when push comes to shove they in fact forced now israel to open more crossings in the in the north um and we know that in fact the fact that they have had them closed is part of their use of starvation as a weapon of war i mean that it's unfathomable that you would use that. I mean, when we talk about it, it seems, you know, we're saying it in one in one way rhetorically, but they're actually starving the people of Gaza as a weapon of war. Um, and the fact that we've we have allowed it to happen and we've continued to arm them while it's happening. Just got some messages coming in, which I want to read. Hi again, lovely Tricia. All the lives lost in all these dreadful wars is horrendous and the death of the aid workers is dreadful. But we mustn't lose sight, sight of October 7th when Hamas went into Israel and committed the most heinous of crimes. If there is a ceasefire for Israel to stop, then this will just allow Hamas to regroup and do the same again. I'm sick of the Jews being persecuted from time immemorial. There will never be peace when genocide is the aim. Israel still has my support um and another one that's penny from essex uh, and israel gaza hi trisha outraged by yasmin ahmed's opening comments uh i'm sick to death of hearing about so-called war crimes by israel like many others no mention of the atrocities committed by hamas six months ago hamas are preventing a ceasefire as they are making outrageous demands they don't want peace israel is at war rachel what what do you say to that since that second uh especially that second message is um aimed at you yeah well i mean first of all let's be very clear and, and Human Rights Watch has been very, very clear that what Hamas did was war crimes. I mean, it was absolutely atrocious. They targeted innocent civilians and that is, you know, should be unequivocally and I stand here and Human Rights, stands, Human Rights Watch stands here to unequivocally condemn what Hamas has done. But the reality is one war crime or one crime or one violation does not 
warrant or justify another. So whilst we obviously have condemned that, it does not provide Israel with the justification legally or morally to now commit crimes against the Palestinian people. And secondly, what I would say is just as the, the, the Hamas action does not justify what Israel is doing. We also have to think about the just as the decades of crimes that have been committed by the Israeli government, including the crime of apartheid and persecution, does not warrant what Hamas did. So I agree with your listeners to the extent that what we can't do here is talk about what justifies something else. A crime, yeah. a serious violation should never, ever happen. Each life should be valued. But the problem is here, often what we don't do is we don't see the Palestinian lives as equal to those of Israeli lives. And that is, I, I think, I absolutely critical. And, and just before we go, the last one, Israel Gaza, why do you speak to such misinformation from Yasmin? Israel is not stopping any aid. In fact, Israel is supplying more than is expected of it, says Natasha. Uh, uh, that's Natasha's opinion. What is? What are the facts on the ground? The reality in the gr on the ground is that the International Court of Justice ordered Israel to ensure that there was a provision of, that, that was unimpeded humanitarian provision. Within the month after that order came down, there were less trucks and less humanitarian provision than the month prior to that. There is absolutely no uh, a question that Israel has been blocking humanitarian aid. And in fact, the fact that they have now opened the crossings in the north evidences the fact that for all these months they had blocked aid from coming in. I mean, it, you don't need to listen to me. You need to just listen to the UN, to our own prime minister, to our own foreign secretary. Everyone has been saying unequivocally that and, Israel... And, and indeed, yeah, we. I was going to say we talked to aid agencies actually on the ground there with yeah. workers who would support what uh, you are you're is, saying. Exactly. There, there's no question. I mean, we, we, we humanitarian organisations on the ground, international organisations yeah. have been clear that they have trucks waiting at the border, waiting at the border to go in, tonnes of food and other, other humanitarian goods to go in, and they have not been allowed to go in by Israel. So it, it is just clearly a fact. Yasmin, thank you so much uh, for your, your time today. I do thank you. Uh, that's it, Yasmin Ahmed, who is the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. Uh, after the break, we will be crossing live to uh, Southern Israel. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're that supposed to it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Uh, continuing our coverage of um, six months and since the atrocity that happened on October the 7th, um, I'm crossing now live to, uh, let's see, he's on the Gaza border in Israel, Zach Anders, who's a correspondent uh, based there. Zach, hello and thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, Hi, six months on. Hi, um, just reading uh, uh, Ashel, uh, one of your, your colleagues, Anshel Pe uh, Pfeffer, who's in Jerusalem with the Times. He's done a brilliant piece in today's Sunday Times, looking at six mm -hmm. months on and how the propaganda war, the tide has started to turn, not just outside Israel, but inside Israel as well, with Netanyahu's um, enemies, if you can call them that, uh, quoting the Six Day War, you know, the, the Six Day War was a completely different thing. Uh, fighting and defeating Hamas, you can kill as many as you like. It's you can't kill a, 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 an ideology. Well, I mean, we've seen Israeli politics in the fabric of Israeli society really stretch to the limits in these last few days. Um, sure you've probably seen some of the images of the tens of thousands of people that were out in Tel Aviv last night. There was a, a vehicle that rammed through the crowd, multiple people injured, uh, and there's been a firestorm of political debates surrounding that very moment, considering uh, some of the statements that the driver was making with the crowd in Hebrew uh, before the police officer shoved him back into his vehicle and said, go away, and then the driver drives through the crowd uh, wow. it, it's remarkable to watch and to be here these last six months and see how challenging it has been for people to find common ground on issues that at the very beginning, uh, they were all united behind. The elimination of Hamas uh, was a very clear issue for the Israeli public, but now it's become so contextually rich uh, around, okay, how do we do that? And where are we, what path is this leading us down? Israelis feel more isolated in the world. They think that their options now are more limited. The flights that would take them to certain places out of Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv don't go there anymore. And the airlines are saying that they just won't fly into Tel Aviv anymore. Like the flight to South Africa, for example. The international relations that have been strained or the severed ties uh, that have been seen uh, is really felt uh, in the Israeli public. And uh, the images, of course, speak for themselves, too. I mean, I, I'm looking out with my binoculars over a, a ruined Gaza, Gaza city behind me, uh, and, and the devastation is absolutely incredible as I'm hearing more explosions off into the distance as well. And, and, and also, uh, you talk about the political unrest that's happening within Israel. There's the whole issue of um, the um, uh, orthodox uh, scholars being, you know, made to go to war uh, and fighting back against that. Yeah, uh, 
The draft summons for some of the uh, Orthodox was uh, Orthodox Jews have been uh, submitted, and these younger uh, of age of military age men are now going to be expected uh, to fight. This was a long-standing issue before the Israel Hamas war, but it was always kicked. The can was kicked down the road. Um, and then we saw the Supreme Court, uh, the judici judicial system here in Israel, uh, within the last two weeks, make a ruling that would essentially push these uh, uh, Orthodox into service. Um, and that's where we've seen, uh, again, another flashpoint for protests, this time in Jerusalem primarily. Um, but those have been incredibly violent as well. Um, and, and I should say that if you were to walk through Jerusalem, these days and you spot a protest they could be about wildly different things you've got the prime minister's residence on one side of town so if you see a protest around his residence it's likely for either an end to the war kind of protest or release the hostages now kind of protest but if you go into some of the older parts of the old city of jerusalem and you see a protest around there it could have to do with the draft summons uh the, the state of the war you know it, it's a uh, very diverse the frustrations that are bubbling up all across this, the the country it's interesting that because i don't think there's as much coverage of of that um it's often painted i'd suggest in the western uh newspapers as uh black and white you know israel versus hamas israel versus versus the war un human rights and what have you it it Israel now seems to be almost fracturing under the under Netanyahu. And, you know, I would say primarily where the, the fractures lie is within this military strategy, because like I mentioned earlier, most people are in agreement that an elimination of Hamas is the number yeah. one goal, that uh, everything since this day six months ago, October 7th, um, it has made sense that going into Gaza, whatever that looks like, and eliminating their enemy has been the black and white part, right? But where things have become so confusing and difficult for the Israeli public, who also kind of have dual leaders right now, um, uh, Benny Gantz is polling higher than Netanyahu if an election was held today. So his contingent inside the Israeli government also has a lot of support, and he's proposing his own ideas on how to defeat Hamas and how to uh, expedite this war. You talk to a lot of people in the first two weeks of this conflict, they did not think that this would stretch beyond the new year. They thought they would be in Gaza, that they would defeat Hamas very quickly. Of course, this is anecdotal. Not everyone felt this way, but yeah. the, the general sense within the public was that there was going to be uh, a quick mission to accomplish defeating Hamas. But uh, just today, we see the IDF pull out of Khan Yunus, withdraw forces uh, from the second largest city in the Gaza Strip. Not really sure. And the Israeli public mixed results as they receive this news. They're not really sure what this means for the operation. Does this mean that the Rafa operation that they've been talking about for months is going to be postponed? Will it happen altogether? Where does the U.S. fit into all this? Is it because the U.S. has pressured Israel to pull out of this area that they did so? A lot of questions, a lot of people really unsure where the military campaign stands currently and where it's going. Zach, I could talk to you for a lot longer, but I know I've got to let you go. So I do thank you for your, your time today. Zach Anders there uh, reporting directly from uh, southern Israel on the Gaza border. Um, we've I've got a call. Have we still got our caller, Leora, in Hertfordshire. Leora, uh, Trisha. hello. I'm hoping you're still there. I am still here, but hello. Trisha, hello. I am so upset about what I'm hearing on your program. I was going to phone in last week as well. I cannot hold back anymore. The lies and the misinformation that is being spoken and your program upsets me more than I can possibly what, express what, in words. What, what in particular has got you upset, Leora? So, well, when Yasmin was speaking, I was shouting in my head at the television. So she talked about um, the Hamas or Palestinian people not having access to maybe legal or anything like that. Well, you tell me what access have, have um, anybody had to the over 130 hostages that are still being held, that have been held for six months. What about... She did, well, she did, 
in 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 her in her um defense i mean we 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 you know that uh, uh, those human rights that's part of the human rights and their human rights as well and hamas have broken a lot of international law and human rights uh you know uh, as far as that is concerned she did mention that israel has sent in medication for the for the hostages that were ill and it's been found in other places uh, baby Kassir was four months old when he was taken hostage this is just appalling. Well, we, nobody, nobody's disagreeing. Nobody is disagreeing with you. But everybody's talking about how there should be a ceasefire, right? No, but don't get me wrong, nobody deserves to die, right? No mm. innocent civilian deserves to die. However, no, so we're also talking no. about the numbers of people in Palestine, from Palestinians who've been killed, and the numbers are over 30,000. Now, I don't yeah. doubt for any minute that there have been innocent people caught up in it. That's the tragedy of war. It's the same in Ukraine. It's the same worldwide. But um, this is Hamas who are giving out the numbers. There's no verification. Oh, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's not just that Hamas. We, if you've watched our show, we've talked to people and the British doctors who've actually gone in there, who are actually working and what have you. So let's say they've oh, exaggerated it. Let's say uh, they, they're saying, I think, 33,000. Let's say it's 30,000, 20,000. We do know that 70% of the victims are women and, and children. Okay. Um, and, and are we saying, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the, 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 the young people, I mean, it was horrific what Hamas her, her, her did, and it's horrific about taking the hostages, all of those lives lost. But as I, I agree with Yasmin, though, that one breaking, one horrific thing does not make some another horrific thing Absolutely. Uh, okay. But however, why are these women and babies and children being killed? Okay, so what isn't being reported is, uh, or it's not being uh, reported widely, is that Hamas hide behind the civilians. They do not care. Why are Hamas hiding in hospitals? Why are Hamas hiding in schools? I couldn't because listen. Listen, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. But it's still even Israel themselves. What do you say to the Israelis? And you just heard um, uh, Zach reporting. What do you say to the Israelis, the, the thousands now, who are taking to the streets, who are angry with their own government? You, I think you can love a country, but hate a leader or dislike what a leader is doing. What do you say to all of the thousands of Israelis taking to the street who may not agree with you? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying they disagree with you about Hamas. They, uh, that's the common enemy. But it's not just, uh, you know, uh, this is the, the thing. It's not black and white. No. You know? And so what do you say to all of those Israelis who are taking to the streets to complain about the way in which their government is doing this? The, the, the Israelis have been going on the streets since before October the 7th. I know because my cousins have been uh, going on the streets demonstrating against Netanyahu. Don't get me wrong, Netanyahu right. has a lot of people who don't like him, and that's another story to be dealt with in the future. But a lot mm. of them are cross because they want their hostages home. These hostages... They're my brothers, they're my sisters, they're my parents, they're my children, they're my sisters, they're my brothers. That is how Jews and Israelis feel, right? No, they're no, our family, right? And they are cross because they want their hostages home. They, they're I... cross because there isn't, um, there isn't a, um, an agreement between Hamas and Israel. And why isn't there an agreement? Because Hamas won't make the agreement. Well, let's hope, let's talk, uh, let's hope that they're, they're talking now. I've got to end it there, but thank you. Thank you for calling in. Got some other messages, which um, I'm going to read out a little bit later, but uh, I'm going to take a, a break now. We'll be back with more in a moment. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just reading a headline now. The majority of voters in the UK, apparently, uh, in Britain, back a ban on arms sales to Israel. This is according to a YouGov po uh, poll. Um, it's the first up-to-date assessment. Uh, the poll found strong support. Oh, I hit, let me start. The poll start shows that amongst all the voters in the UK, majority, 56% to 17%, are in favour of a ban on the export of arms and spare parts. Uh, majority of 59% to 12% of voters say Israel is fighting, uh, it's violating human rights in Gaza. The poll found strong support for an arms export ban amongst voters intending to vote Labour at the next election. An overwhelming 71% to 9% of those intending to vote Labour back an arms export ban. Uh, I found it interesting in this, though, um, Tory voters by two to one say Israel is uh, violating human rights. Um, got some messages. Israel, Gaza, Gaza, Israel, Trisha, I find this discussion quite sickening to listen to. Try talking about the Israeli hostages still being held by Hamas. Is that not a contravention of human rights? Yes, we've said it is. How about stop the supply of arms to Hamas? I uh, agree. This current conflict was started by Hamas on 7th of October and was and is supported by the Palestinians in Gaza and here in the UK. I disagree with that. We, we've got to be careful not to conflate a terrorist organisation uh, with the ordinary population. You'll get no sympathy from me until you address these issues. That's from Peter and Stephen. Gaza, Israel, Trisha, I'm angry, angry listening to this aid worker. Um, that was Yasmin, who was human rights. I uh, don't hear her mention Hamas. We did. Why they... Why they don't look starved? Why are they blaming Israel for all this aid has been getting it and Hamas has, uh, has it all? 
we know that's not true. Why don't they mention the other Muslim countries that are starving? That's from Carol, not quite sure. Uh, anyway, I will still read your messages out. Uh, the number was on the screen there, 03444991000. You can text the word talk to 87222X at Talk TV. I do want to move on now to our faith panel. I know many of you are uh, big fans of our faith panel. We've got some brilliant people on um, our faith panel today. We have Charlie Bell, who is an assistant priest of St. John the Divine in Kennington. He's also a psychiatrist. Um, and we have the wonderful Dabindajit Singh, who's principal advisor of the Sikh Federation. Thank you both for joining us. And uh, Charlie, hello and welcome. So excited to have you join our faith panel. Our two subjects today, Charlie, and I'm going to kick off with you. We just had a quick look at Charlie there. Awe and dread, how religions have responded to, to uh, total solar eclipses over the centuries, because it's going to happen over North America. Um, with Christianity, I read some Christians have believed that an eclipse portends the end, uh, coming of the end of times. And Marjorie Taylor Greene over here in the United States has said it's a sign for America to repent. But <laughs> Charlie, talk to us about uh, the uh, uh, an eclipse and Christianity. Yeah, thanks. So it's really great to be with you. So thanks for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, you know, as you said, I'm a psychiatrist and, a, and I'm a priest. So I'm a, in, 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 in a sense, I'm a scientist and, a, and, and I come at this from a theological background. Um, and I don't think in the modern world, those two things need to be seen as, as um, conflicting with one another. Um, but unfortunately, every so often you get um, commentators who wear their faith um, very much on their sleeve and not always terribly uh, intelligently, who decide to, um, to to kind of hark back to theological understandings or ideas um, from an era before what we knew scientifically. And I think I'm afraid that's what, um, yeah, you know, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing um, in, 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 in finding the most narrow interpretation of, of what an eclipse could possibly mean um, and finding that, uh, that the eclipse happens to agree with your particular interpretation. Historically, though, you know, um, eclipses have been seen within the Christian tradition and through other faith traditions as, as being portents of something. And there are certain ways of interpreting biblical texts and so on, which would suggest that um, that, that the eclipse or whatever particular natural disaster or, or other um, natural event um, has some kind of meaning imbued in it from God and, and on a particular place, a particular time, a particular people. But I think in, in the modern world, um, that's not something that mainstream Christianity would really um, uh, be considering when we think about uh, the eclipse that's coming tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And Dabinajit, what about within the Sikh faith? Um, Trisha, this, this is uh, an interesting subject because obviously the Sikh faith is uh, just over 550 years old. And this, this whole idea around the eclipse has been going on for thousands of years. And if you look at different faiths and different cultures, often what's associated with the eclipse is fear, bad omens, that sort of thing. Um, and the first Sikh guru, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, he was totally opposed to rituals and superstition. So one of the things he said about the eclipse was this is just a natural phenomenon. And those people that partake in rituals, like uh, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, you know, people think you need to bathe before and after an eclipse you need to fast during an eclipse and the worst one i've heard is if you're a pregnant woman you have to take a bath every two hours and what? Like this, these are complete nonsense they make no logical sense and therefore you know you can't wash away your sins because that's what they try and do with bathing that you, you you simply cannot do this and therefore you need to put aside these rituals and superstitions and just see this as a natural phenomenon mm -hmm. it, it is interesting isn't it there's a lot of folklore linked to eclipses and darkness charlie coming back to you the, the light and darkness um a big you know uh big i'd say cornerstones almost of Christianity and just about every religion. 
Yeah, and you know, um, in the creation stories from Genesis, which which uh, the Christian faith shares with the Jewish faith, um, you know, we have that we have the night and we have the day. We have the 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 the, the light and the darkness. And through so much of Scripture, um, light and light and darkness becomes a kind of motif. Darkness associated with evil, light associated mm -hmm. with God or with goodness. Of course historically there's been some real problems with that because we've seen actually darkness being associated um, particularly during the era of the slave trade with with black people mm. and with and with blackness and actually that became a significant theological motif which was born out of a complete nonsense a complete lie um and which which is which you know we have to be very careful in in contemporary talk about light and darkness that we're aware and alert to those kind of historical um you know scandals which which have engulfed mm. some of the way that we've talked theologically so yeah certainly it runs through so much of what we talk about but we just have to be very careful when we talk about that language and we have to not do frankly what you know what what taylor green is doing here with the, the idea of the eclipse finding our own particular idea and deciding that a particular natural phenomenon must support our particular interpretation at any one particular time yeah absolutely and and uh, Binger, did light and dark within the sikh faith is there is there are there stories are there teachings around that I think the, the the phrase of light and dark or black and white, these are things that are quite common to most faiths, but the Sikh way of life is all about actually doing good deeds. And I think when we're talking about the eclipse and what's being said in 2024, I think what people of faith should be doing is actually focusing that actually our different faiths very much have common characteristics of doing good, looking after those that are less fortunate than us. And it doesn't matter what labels we give them, black, white, dark, light, they're, they're irrelevant. We need to see people as humanity. Yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a very powerful message. And just to, to finish on this subject, because I want to take uh, our faith panel over the break because we ran over with our, our previous um, uh, item, Charlie, again on the on the, the the around the subject of light and darkness, candles. Um, you know, are they not sort of a symbol of of lightness? Uh, I mean, you know, of of the light. Again, they feature in many many religions, including really strongly within Christianity. Yeah, just a week ago we celebrated our Easter feast, um, and at the beginning of one of the most powerful services of the church year, we start by bringing a single candle, what we call the Paschal candle, into the church. And that Paschal candle, a single light in the darkness as the sun has set, that single light um, suggesting that, um, or, or being representative of, of Christ's being raised from the tomb and of the light entering back into the world. So candles form a huge part of, um, of Christian uh, practice uh, now. In fact, candles during the Reformation in England were a huge, um, huge trouble. We had lots of people arguing we shouldn't have candles even in churches and um, so we've come really? a long way from that kind of debate oh yes absolutely and and debates about candles being on the altar table candles being even permitted to be lit so we've come a long long way why, from there why, why and, was that charlie uh, why, why was that because they were seen as as papist as as catholic um and and particular yeah. groups within the reformed church of england found thought that, that that the idea of having candles was was actually um a kind of harking back to the dangerous um the dangerousness of the catholic faith we've moved beyond that we've grown up a bit yeah. um but we still see some of those debates worldwide in some parts of christianity but yes certainly in in in, in the church of england we'd see um candles as a very a significant part of of how we express ourselves symbolically within mm -hmm. our worship and is it the same within the Sikh faith, uh, Dabindijit? Yeah, candles themselves uh, don't really have any any significance, but obviously I, I know in previous faith panels we've talked about Diwali, Festival of Light, and how, you know, light is generally seen as a positive thing, fireworks and things like that, but it has no real religious significance. I think this is just something that we've all sort of been brought up with in our different faiths, uh, and often it... it, it expresses some sort of positivity. Mm, absolutely. Now, for both of you, stay with us and, and for our audience as well, uh, because um, let me just outline what we're going to be talking about with our faith panel after the break. And you may well have an opinion on this. 
Um, Ex-President Trump is selling God Bless USA Bibles for $59.99. That's £47.50. He's facing mounting legal bills. Uh, he actually, on his truth uh, 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 website, he put, Happy Holy Week. Let's make American America Pray Again. That was during Easter. Uh, and that was alongside a website link, of course, selling the book. Uh, he needs to raise, what, 450 million he owes following a civil fraud a judgment, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I had a quick Google, and he's not the only leader who has, or would be leader, I should say, who has used a religion. Um, it's happened in India. Uh, it's happened with Putin as well, allying himself. I just want to say in the Times of India, there's a, a, an excellent piece uh, about uh, Indian Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi. So uh, after the break, I'm going to be asking our panel uh, their thoughts about religious, you know, uh, religion being used by would-be leaders to either get into power or retain power. Uh, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that. 03444991000. You can text the word TALK to 87222 or X at TALK TV. Uh, let us know what you think. Should leaders or would-be leaders or people who want to be in power use religion as a tool to get there? What do you think God would make of that? That's gonna what I'm going to be asking our faith panel right after the break. So uh, stay with us and... Uh, Give me a call, 03444991000. You can text the word TALK to 8722 or X at TALK TV. And don't forget, you can WhatsApp the 0344 number as well. Back with more after this. This is TALK TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to abbon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Joining us in this hour, later on, we'll be talking to Julian Assange's wife, Stella Assange, uh, about the recent developments there. Also, our Mind Matters, uh, we'll be looking at that too, and Joseph's judgments. But I'm here with our faith panel, first and foremost, uh, Father Charlie Bell, who's an assistant priest, St. John the Divine in Kennington, and a psychiatrist to boot, and uh, the principal advisor of the Sikh Federation, David Najit Singh. We're talking about um would be president again uh trump selling I, I call it his version of a bible because it's not just a bible he's got the constitution in there he's got various texts in there and what have you uh as well but he's selling it for uh the equivalent of 47 pounds 50. he's not the only person who wants to be in power or who is in power to use religion. Uh, in February this year, uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi led the consecration of a vast new Hindu temple atop the ruins of a demolished Muslim mosque in the town of Ayodhya in northern India, showing how far he will go to use religion uh, in uh, staying in power in India. And the Russian Orthodox church leader has declared Ukraine the Ukraine invasion a holy war he's become very close to Putin and um, Putin is uh, uses that in uh, many of his pronouncements in um, as, as a backup for what he's doing so my question to uh, the panel is basically I want their thoughts I mean is this something God would approve of Charlie I mean, the, the Donald Trump Bible thing is just an absurdity, isn't it? I mean, it's just ludicrous. Um, and from, from this side of the pond, it doesn't make nearly as much sense as it might do to folk who know the American Christian evangelical situation and, and indeed the political situation a bit better. But it's it's still it's still bonkers. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think we need to name that and say it's 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 ludicrous, but it's also possibly dangerous. And I think that's some of those other uh, examples that you've given run the risk of um, of, of really putting uh, bringing religion into disrepute, but also doing really dangerous and damaging things with it. The minute that you say you've got God on your side, um, you, you're actually you're taking a big risk. You're taking a big risk with God, might I, might I suggest, but you're also taking quite a quite a significant risk because you're saying to people actually, your religious identity and your religious understanding is tied up in the in the success or otherwise of a nation state, um, and I don't think that's very healthy. And I don't really think there's any serious reading of the Christian faith which would which would suggest that that's kind of compatible at all. But it must create conflict within a congregation, mustn't it? Yeah, and you know, in my setting in the Church of England, you know, we're an established church. We try to be a church that's able to speak to people of whatever political, um, whatever political stripe. So we don't want to be at the Church of the Labour Party. We don't want to be the Church of the Conservative Party. We don't want to be the Church of any party. Actually, we're wanting to be the Church to the nation. Um, that is, you know, trying to walk alongside people with their variety of different political perspectives. Now, that's not to say that sometimes we really align with particular political causes. Uh, and I think mm. that's 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 kind of inevitable in, in, in whenever a church or any religious organization. Well, well, well I was going to, I, I, I was going to mention, I was going to mention Archbishop Justin Welby. He's not no. backwards and coming forwards on many issues. 
Yeah, that's a lovely phrase. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, and actually, um, the bishops in the House of Lords, we know we have a we have an established church, we have set seats for the bishops in the House of Lords, a certain number of our bishops there, and they do comment on uh, on political issues. So it's not that we're not called to be political, and it's not that actually churches can't express something which which would be considered political in, in the wider kind of um, wider public forum, but it's about being party political. And it's also, I think, about being nationalistic. And I think once you err into saying that you know jesus jesus is a member of of the conservative party or jesus is actually american that's where we end up in in danger oh i couldn't agree with you more uh Dabindajit, uh, uh, i mentioned uh india and what's happening in india so what are your thoughts on this i think trisha this this is a fascinating subject that actually governments around the world need to take very seriously because uh, in a way, the, the story around uh, Trump and selling Bibles to pay his legal bills is a bit of a joke, and, and that's probably the way lots of Brits will see it. However, I think when you talk about India and Putin, it gets a lot more serious. And the reason why I say that, in America, there are lots of fundamental freedoms, like press freedom, that mm. you, we know that democracy is in a way protected by the freedoms you have in your country. And if you take the likes of Narendra Modi, everything he's done over the last decade has been about focusing on the Hindu majority and creating a Hindu state. And this isn't me saying this, this is actually people that live in India, opponents say, India's talked about being the largest democracy, but on every single scale of democracy and freedoms, India has slipped to say it's become an autocracy. Everyone knows the outcome of the elections in May, that the BJP will come to power because their focus has been on the majority. Now, India being the most populous country has lots of minorities, whether they be Christians, Muslims or Sikhs. And there are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. There are hundreds of millions of Muslims. And how must they feel when they see, you know, you mentioned the temple that was destroyed or the, or the mosque that was destroyed to create the temple. These, it's not just that, it's press freedoms. It's the judicial freedoms. And therefore, I'm far more worried about what's happening in India and obviously with Putin in Russia because the Orthodox Church there is very influential. And if they call the Ukraine war a holy war, then unfortunately that sort of brainwashes a huge majority of Russians to back Putin in what many of us see, see as something that's wrong. And I think we need more world leaders to call out. I don't really care if it's Modi, Putin or Trump, but they need to call out behaviors that abuse religion for their own personal uh, power. Uh, very wise words. Thank you so much. And thank you to our, our panel. Charlie, it's been lovely having you. I, will, I hope you will uh, join us again. And uh, Dabindajit, a pleasure as always. That's our faith panel there. We had Father Charlie Bell, Assistant Priest of St. John the Divine in Kennington. And uh, Dabindajit Singh, Principal Advisor of the Sikh Federation. What are your thoughts on those those subjects. I'd be interested uh, to, to, to hear what you feel about uh, Trump selling uh, Bibles. I mean, it, it might be a joke, but if he sells but one, isn't it a little bit scary? And uh, as, as Charlie and Doug Bindigit said, we can kind of laugh at that and call it a joke. But in, uh, as, as he mentioned, in India and in Russia, we can see what happened when what happens when world leaders use religion to retain power or, or keep wars going. Um, they're not the only ones by far. 03444991000, you can text the word TALK to 87222-87222 or X at TALK TV. Get involved in the discussion. Got a message here because it's World Health Day. Hi, Tricia. When you said it was World Health Day, I cooked the healthiest items I had in. Broccoli with boiled potatoes. And I had licorice after. That's from Graham. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, 
Okay, so uh, let's, uh, are we ready to take a break now? Let me just check. No, we will come to our, we will come to our um, uh, all things judicial uh, with uh, Joseph uh, his, and his judgments. Let me just change my bits of paper here. Joseph, first of all, uh, Joseph Cotri Monson, hello and welcome back to the show. Always have uh, a pleasure to have you on the show again. Joseph, two things we're going to be discussing today I thought was interesting. Uh, the Strasbourg Court could rule that governments have to uh, uh, protect people from things like climate change. Uh, judges from the court will decide next week whether people's human rights have been breached by the failure of governments to protect them from the harmful effects of climate change. Um, what are your, your thoughts on this? Because the legal challenge is based on the claim that failure to tackle climate change sufficiently to protect the public yeah. amounts to breach of Article 2, the right to life, and Article 8, the right to a family life. I'm just thinking, if this is successful, could it be the blueprint for people all over the world? I mean, you've already got in the United States individuals suing corporations um, for, you know, just this sort of thing. Yeah, that it's a... It's it's interesting because I think probably uh, good afternoon as always, Tricia. Good afternoon to everybody at home and on the move. Uh, it's interesting because, yeah, you do have this kind of uh, uh, kind of governmental and political commitment, don't we? That that we're kind of continually told about with regard to climate change, but it often doesn't seem to re result in real action. Uh, various uh, uh, climate change summits uh, resulting actually uh, in uh, little being produced in terms of targets being hit, targets being changed after the fact, five years being rolled on, five years being added. Uh, and I think it's inevitable that you actually get uh, courts becoming, uh, starting to become involved. And you're right, you see it in US uh, in various cases. We kind of see it in the cases we've talked about to do with protests and the fact that there's this disconnect between what governments and corporations are saying uh, and uh, in a kind of in, in terms of the shareholders, et cetera, uh, uh, and, and how society then views them. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. now we're starting to see it increasingly with, with various types of uh, litigation. Uh, we see it with the Good Law Project, for example, uh, where governments aren't standing up to their responsibilities in various ways. And I think it was inevitable that Strasbourg would become involved uh, with regard to climate change, because climate change is uh, a, f a feature in our uh, in, in our common conversation at the moment uh, that affects yeah. the m very most serious things in people's life and when government and even our domestic courts aren't interfering or, or uh, interceding uh, adequately uh, the last chance saloon uh, the the that that last bastion uh, that last p possibility of basic rights uh, being secured. Well, that is Strasbourg. That's why we signed, yeah. that's why we wrote the European Convention uh, of Human Rights yeah. in the post-war environment. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, it's a group of Swiss women in their 70s backed by Greenpeace. One woman said she couldn't leave her house for three weeks during the summer because it was so hot. Then there's a second case of Damien Karem, former yeah. mayor of a uh, suburb of Dunkirk, who argued his home and the surrounding areas will be underwater by 2040 if France fails to meet its greenhouse uh, gas target. Third one, six Portuguese nationals aged 14 to 25 claiming they've uh, suffered anxiety or ill health as a result of forest fires. So people are taking actual instances like forest fires, you say yeah. extreme heat, flooding, etc., and saying, uh, I'm going to take you to court. I'm going to take my government to court because they're not doing anything to stop this happening again in the future. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because people might go, well, hang on a minute, I don't believe in climate change or this is kind of yeah. about opinions or the culture wars or whatever. No, it's not. It's about real things. If you spent time in southern Spain, for example, and, you know, uh, I was oh. there on holiday two years ago and I just would watch this forest fire on a mountain burning and burning and burning yeah. 
for days. You know, these are real things, real people's lives. Yes, they suffered anxiety, but those people suffer ill health, you know, and, yes. and the, the, these are real alarming and immediate changes to our environment that are connected to our behavior, you know, and I don't yeah. regard myself particularly as an environmentalist or kind of, you know, particularly au fair progressive in that regard. But I, I think it's at the stage where, where, where people on all sides of the spectrum, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of they're, they're saying enough. They're saying enough is enough, isn't it? I, yeah. I want to move on because this is a really important one because we've got uh, Stella Assange later on. Yes. And in, in Julian Assange, he's faced uh, further a further weight over his extradition uh, ruling. Uh, the High Court has ruled that the US must give assurances that Julian Assange will not face the death, death penalties. They've got three weeks to provide that before the judges will consider dismissing the WikiLeaks yeah. founder's appeal against extradition to the US. Um, uh, this is a case that's been going on since, what, 2010? 2011 when um uh, yeah. julian assange has been in the uk prison since 2019 <clears throat> he's wanted in the us for disclosing secret military files as i said back in 2010 and 2011 now you've been following this um you know closely um for time's sake in a nutshell uh, how important is this latest ruling Okay, well, first of all, I do, do want to get this out of the way because I know you've got Stella Assange uh, uh, coming on. You know, as as a lawyer, perhaps uh, the person I have most admiration for in this whole case is Stella Assange. She's taken a huge burden on herself as both his wife, you know, and protector, because that's what women do in in these relationships. In my experience, when the family yeah. is under is under siege, as his lawyer, and also as a yeah. fantastically articulate spokesperson for his campaign, and with what dignity uh, and what strength has she has she performed those functions? But where we are now in terms of the case, basically, the facts are complex. There have been all types of legal arguments about rights to speech about political motivations all of those arguments up to high court stage which is not i suspect the final stage uh, have failed save for two uh, and those relate to assurances that the us has not given and i think a little bit arrogantly hasn't given and has said we're not providing them for for other reasons uh, assurances that Mr. Assange, first of all, will not face the death penalty. That is a bar to extradition from this country, and there must be such assurances where the argument is raised, and also that he will be able to rely on his First Amendment rights, and that's what we call the right to free speech, and that's another of our European Convention uh, rights that that must be uh, th that where it is raised that those uh, that that as a non U.S. citizen, he will be tried uh, in the U.S., that he must be able to rely on those rights. And those assurances haven't yet come. Now, on May the 20th, there will be a further hearing in the High Court. If those assurances aren't provided, this case will go to the Court of Appeal. The High Court have already said we will grant leave to appeal. And then we're looking at 2025. Uh, they may be provided, but th those assurances may be provided, but that doesn't mean that there won't still be argument. I think this 15-year saga will trundle yeah. on, uh, you know, political in some senses. I think we're all sympathetic to what we knew and what we found out uh, about abuses in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Ooh. At the same time, there are all types of arguments about national security. I won't go into any of that, but this is a this is a man's life. He's been 15 years essentially in prison, including in the Ecuadorian embassy. He's been in Belmarsh. Yeah. I've been in Belmarsh dozens of times. It's dystopian. If you imagine the kind of prison that people might have been sent uh, to in a, a, a 1980s science fiction film, uh, the 1984 type dystopian reality, that's what it's yeah. like, and his regime will be among the worst there. Yeah, but this is this is a comma and not a, a, a full stop, so to speak, Joseph. Always wonderful having you on the show. Short but very sweet and very succinct. Thank you so much, Joseph Cotry Monson. There, um, with, with two major issues, uh, legal issues that have been in the news. Uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, it's time for our Mind Matters segment. Stay with us.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. This World Health Day. Did you know it was World Health Day? Well, I'm just reminding you. Um, and when I talk about health, when I, I, I don't know about you, but I talk about mind, body and soul, you haven't got full health unless you've got mental health as well. What we tend to forget is when people have chronic illnesses or chronic conditions, um, everybody in the medical world tends to focus on the physical part of that. But with every single, in every single instance, there's a mental health part of that, isn't it? Dealing with it. Your life is different. Um, you could have different outcomes as far as your career is concerned, if you can work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my next guest knows that all too well. Um, she's talking about vitiligo. Now, if you think, oh, one in a hundred people, that's a hell of a lot of people, one, around one in a hundred people in the UK develop vitiligo. Uh, it's common, as I said before, affecting about 1% of the world's population. It can start at any age after birth. Uh, but in half of the people affected, apparently it appears before 20 years of age. Now, why have we got this in our Mind Matters segment? Well, I'll get my next guest to, to explain that to us. Uh, Natalie Ambersley is trustee at the Vitiligo Society and joins me now. Natalie, thank you so much for your time. I, I know I use this phrase a lot on this show. Let's start at the very beginning and discuss what we are talking about what is vitiligo. 
So vitiligo is a skin condition where white patches form on the skin due to a lack of melanin. Um, as you mentioned before, anybody can develop the condition, um, any race, any culture, and you mostly develop it by the time you're around 25 years old. Some people may lose all of their pigment, whereas some people in their lifetime may develop one or two spots. Vitiligo really doesn't um, discriminate. No, and, and um, most people would probably have seen mod the model Winnie Harlow, um, and and you have vitiligo as as well. I'm going so so. Tell me, did you always have it? Did did it develop at a certain age? So I developed the condition when I was three years old. Um, it was a tiny patch, no bigger than a five pence piece that formed on the back of my hand. There was no history of the condition um, in my family. So I was the first person to develop it. And I developed it in the 80s. So back then there wasn't any awareness. There was very, very little education on the condition. So for many, many months, we had no idea what the condition was. It was really hard to get a diagnosis. I was turned away from my GP on two occasions. Uh, my parents were just told to you know monitor my skin you know just check to see if any more patches develop when eventually by the time I was around five years old I was diagnosed with vitiligo and I was told that it was non-curable. Now it's most noticeable obviously on people of colour I'm on things of again of uh, Winnie Harlow and Michael Jackson and what have you um, but it's it's not um, it's not just one skin colour or one race that develops it is it? No, anybody can develop it. Um, and it's often caused by, or there's a number of ways that sometimes vitiligo is caused. It could be stress. It could be a graze or a cut on the skin. Um, it could be a traumatic event that encourages the condition to start. So there are a number of ways. And this is all, you know, these things are still being researched and looked into because we don't really know how, how it starts in anybody. And also, I, I, it can be uh, drug induced. Um, I'm thinking about chemotherapy, um, go and and uh, pigment changes. I know when I, I'm having gone through chemotherapy, I mean, I'm wearing lots of makeup now, but I had pretty severe pigment changes. And for some people, that can go on to be being vitiligo. Uh, am I right in that? Yeah, it can. And it's an incredibly striking condition. And as you say, it is very, very noticeable in people of colour. Um, I've got it all over my hands. Um, I've got it on my body. I've got it along on my legs. Like it, it can be everywhere, including my face. And it's really hard when the condition is on your face. There are a number of treatments, um, but there isn't a treatment that actually cures vitiligo. I've had oh. steroid creams. Um, I've done light treatment, which worked really well for me, but there aren't any treatments that actually cure vitiligo at the moment. And that's what everyone's really kind of hoping for. Is it just, is it quote unquote, just something that's visual or are there actually, is there itching? Is there pain? Is there anything else like that? So people don't really experience pain. It is just highly, highly visible. And that's where a lot of the psychological trauma comes from, yeah. from people with the condition. But people do um, get sometimes itching in their skin. So if a new patch is forming on their skin, they might find the area starts itching for a little while because a new form is actually patching on their skin. But on the whole, it's not life-threatening. It's just highly visible, which is why people really struggle. People can get quite depressed with the condition. They find social interaction very difficult. Dating can be really hard. Getting intimate with other people can be really difficult because it's just so striking. And also children at school can be bullied. Mm -hmm. There's lots of myths around what vitiligo is. Some people think it's because you've been burnt. Some people it's because you've been eating the wrong foods and drinking things oh. like milk and fish together. So there's lots of different myths that really do surround the condition, which is why we've done the campaign that we've done at the Vitiligo Society. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, you, and you touch you, you mentioned um, psychological difficulties as well, and some of the myths around that. So, this is something that develops, isn't it? So, if you're at school, and we're talk talking, it usually develops under the age of twenty. Uh, one day you look a certain way, and and then gradually it spreads. Why is it difficult for people? I mean, you mentioned dating and all of those things. Um, are people with vitiligo, what are they? You mentioned teased, are they excluded? What sort of experiences do they have? What experiences did you have? So it's it's highly psychological. I think we live in a world where people are encouraged to look a particular way. 
a particular mm -hmm. type of hair color, a particular type of figure. So when you have something so visual on your skin, you fear the public, you fear what it's going to be like for you in, in the big wide world when you're going to be faced with people. I've struggled immensely with my condition. As a young girl, I didn't really understand that I was different because I was a child. It was my parents kind of having to deal with the people that were staring and asking really inquisitive questions. But by the time I became a, kick, a teenager, I started to feel like under peer pressure. I was looking at my friends, they all looked normal to me. I looked mm. different and I really struggled. I couldn't go swimming with my friends because I didn't want to put a swimsuit on because it was all over my legs. Dating, I didn't do that at all when I was at school, even in my early early 20s, I found that quite hard. Going to a new social setting was difficult because you would feel stared at. When you've got patches around your eyes and around your mouth and you can't find the right makeup to match your skin tone sometimes, all yeah. you're thinking is people staring at you teasing you judging you and looking at you like you are different and it is incredibly hard As, I, I, and i mentioned winnie harlow and she said she felt isolated when she first got it but now it's become a gift i remember when she she broke out onto the scene the i remember the reaction and i think she's amazing for having stayed the course because some of the the, the remarks on newspapers and things like that uh, were horrific has it helped when you've got somebody so pr high profile being out there, being a model on the catwalk, being successful? Is that something that, that has helped? Hugely. I mean, before Winnie Harlow came along, there was no one out there. We didn't see ourselves represented. When you read magazines back in the day, you saw the same models, the same people looking exactly the same way. And there was no one that looked like me. So when she came onto the platform, she gave Vitiligo a voice. She gave young kids hope. She allowed children to dream. She allowed them to feel like they could become models too, because we were sick of seeing the same people. So she really has Put us on the map and now obviously you know back in the day i thought i was the only person in the world with the condition i thought it was created for me i now have friends across the globe with vitiligo i have friends that i go on spa breaks with vitiligo because now i have someone to talk to i have people that i can have conversations with people i can relate to people that understand because back when i was growing up i didn't have that there were no barbie dolls there were no children's books with characters with vitiligo and now we have all of these things and we're feeling empowered and we're allowed to live freely with the condition and just really kind of celebrate ourselves and see it as a unique condition that we can now love Thank you so much for talking so so honestly with me and, and shedding some light on uh, vitiligo. Uh, that is uh, Natalie Ambersley, uh, trustee at the Vitiligo Society, and you can find out more about their organisation online. Um, I, I love I love the way we can have different voices on on this show. Now remember. Your voice is not excluded. 0344-499-1000. You can text the word TALK. There it is on the screen to 8722 or X at TALK TV. Um, keep those numbers in mind because after the break, I'm going to be talking to Julian Assange's wife, Stella Assange, in an exclusive here on TALK TV. Back with that in a moment. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss him. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back, and uh, thank you for joining me. Um, Julian Assange is uh, now, as you heard, if you uh, were watching us when we were talking to Joseph Kochi monson he's facing a further wait over extradition ruling. The issues are, is that uh, the, the High Court has ruled that the US must give assurances that Julian Assange will not face the death penalty. I, I find it interesting that in 2021, the UK High Court ruled that he should be extradited. Uh, Pretty Patel, of course, back that up. She was the then Home Secretary. That was in 2022. But they said he could should be extradited, extradited, and they dismissed claims that his poor mental health might he might mean he might take his life uh, in a US jail. It's hard to it's it, it's hard to wrap your head around the fact that uh, this has been going on since two, since 2011 that it wouldn't have an effect on his mental health. Um, Stella Assange is not only the wife of Julian uh, Assange. She's uh, a brilliant lawyer, as you heard Joseph Cotchie Monson say earlier. Uh, and in an exclusive, we're joined by her now. Stella, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I mentioned there it, that mental health is often dismissed. And in Julian's case, this has been going on for so long. Can I ask you how his mental health is? Well, it's extremely challenging and he's he's suffering immensely. The the judge's um, decision back in 2021 to not extradite him, which was later overturned, that was January 2021. And at that point, she found that his mental state was uh, in such a in such a bad place uh, that he should not be extradited. And then, of course, we know what happened. The U.S. Uh, appealed and so on. Uh, so he's been in a high security prison for almost five years. In fact, it's this week that it will be five years and he's not serving a sentence. He hasn't been convicted in this country. And the case that the U.S. is bringing against him is completely absurd. Um, so just having to deal with the absurdity of, of the case and he's facing 175 years um, in extremely harsh conditions if he's extradited and already harsh conditions here. Uh, it's indefinite, it's cruel, and he's he's fighting every day is, is really a, a fight. And, and you mentioned he's in an high, a, a high security prison. Have you visited him there? What is it like? What If you can describe the conditions under which he's been held, as you say, without a charge for the last five years. Well, it's a, a high security prison, a maximum security prison. As far as uh, UK prisons go, that's where they put the 
the uh, most uh, dangerous criminals um, when they're um, you know facing trial and then later on they're sent on to other prisons once they're convicted. Julian is in fact the prisoner who has spent the longest in Belmarsh uh, on his wing. And the security uh, checks to go in are are extremely stringent. I mean, everyone has to go through it, including our two children who are five and six years old. Uh, they are, you know, they, they get checked, um, they get patted down. There's, uh, they check inside your mouth and inside your hair, under your feet. Uh, so, and there's a dog search and the children also have to go through this. What, what do you tell your children? I mean, when they go to see daddy, how, how do you explain that? Because I know we're, we're, we're talking about the political, but we often forget about the human, you know, that, that we're talking not about Julian Assange, just a cause, but a human being, a daddy, a, a husband. What do you say to your children? Well, I tell them that Julian should never have gone to prison in the first place that he's he's in prison wrongfully uh that he never did anything bad that he's there because bad people put him there um because he made them very angry for exposing the bad things they did uh so it's it's uh you know they're five and six so you really have to go down to uh some uh basics but it's a good it's a good exercise actually because often when julian's case is talked about it's talked about as if it's quite complex and you know you have to know all the backstory but actually you don't have to he published uh information that embarrassed very powerful forces and those powerful forces then put him in prison and it's in every sense the classic you know um uh revenge on on a journalist who exposed a powerful interest and this is something that it's a pattern that we know well and it's happening right now now again as i said you're not only a, you know a wife and a mother um but you're also a very highly respected lawyer how do you juggle all those roles in your personal relationship with julian well i mean um julian has a uh very um significant team of lawyers now uh, for many years i was working on his team uh, and I, I still do uh in some respect but now my my main role uh as far as advocacy goes is is public advocacy um mm. and and basically uh breaking down uh and translating the case into uh why it matters to the general public um, why it matters to free Julian as a human being, uh, and the you know the the implications it has for everyone, because by putting Julian in prison, it's really the public's right to know the truth about um, you know uh, those powerful forces, uh, governments, and so on. Uh, when they do wrongdoing, they have to be able to be exposed without um, if, without that act being punished. Absolutely, absolutely, and Stella. Again, I come back to, but how, as as a human being, you know, I'm just trying to think, and it's a totally different situation. Me with my husband, I often have to juggle even being a journalist with being a wife. You know, um, and I'm just interested uh, how you do that. Well, I see Julian once or twice a week, and those those uh, visits are incredibly important. They're in a meeting room full of people. You know, every uh, every other prisoner who has a visit that day, about forty of them is in the same hall, meeting with their families. We're all each sitting at our tables. Julian's not allowed to stand up only when he comes in, um, and I can hug him and I can hold his hand across the table. Um, we can share a coffee uh, and that kind of thing. And and that's an hour and a half that we have together. And then we also speak over the phone during the day, um, throughout the day. Not We can't speak 24 hours uh, because yeah. there are restrictions and it's only 10 minutes at a time. So that's also very frustrating. But you kind of, uh, you know, you, 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 I don't want to say you adapt, but you kind of do. Without these things, it would be, uh, 
impossible, uh, emotionally impossible uh, for, for both, you know, him and me um, to, to bear the situation. So it's really essential for us to be able to have this kind of constant contact. He knows what I'm doing every day, where I'm going, um, you know, what I'm up to. He speaks to the kids every day. They tell him what's happened at school and so on. So um, that's, you know, that's, that's how we're, how we're uh, living our marriage and our relationship at the moment uh, with our, our, uh, you know, focus on Julian coming home when this, when this nightmare uh, is brought to an end. And the, the nightmare surely would, be, oh, well, obviously would be uh, tenfold if he does get extradited to the USA. Do you, is there a genuine fear that he could face the death penalty? I mean, the US is saying no. Uh, is that not enough? Well, look, uh, they could have given an assurance that they weren't going to bring the death penalty, and they didn't. And in fact, that's a very common uh, assurance to give. And when it comes to the United States, I've learned uh, that this is a, a country that has um, uh, elements within it that want to have been involved in uh, very serious criminality, uh, including planning to kidnap and even kill Julian while he was inside the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, and of course, uh, that was when, when the CIA was led by uh, Mike Pompeo, that was under the Trump administration. But of course, if that's what's already happened, who's to say what might happen? You know, it, it's not just about the Biden administration right now. It's about what may come and how these elements within the United States who hate Julian and want to see him dead by, and send a signal um, by doing so, uh, whether they can take uh, hold of control over his, um, his conditions in a prison or, or, uh, and, and so on. Well, so, well I, was going, I, I know, was going to say, Stella, as well, Trump uh, has said um, very openly that Julian should be <laughs> disappeared should be dead i mean he he came out and and said that if he comes back into power it makes it you know triply scary well that's exactly right when when wikileaks published uh these uh documents from chelsea manning trump was on record saying well uh there should be a death penalty or something mm. uh in relation to this publication uh and it was under the trump administration that this indictment was brought and of course there's a high uh, probability that that there will be a new trump administration um and all the all the people around uh mr trump who may you know maybe wanting to see julian dead again so uh julian of course should never be facing um this this prospect he should just be able to be free he hasn't done anything he hasn't hurt anyone um you know, he just practiced journalism. He he published evidence of others committing criminality, and mm -hmm. there has been a, a kind of a a, a hostile uh, takeover of the legal process in order to, um, you know, further the political goals of uh, these these uh, forces that have been exposed. What what do you mean by that when you say a hostile take over the uh, over the legal process? Well, it's, it's a political case. Uh, so mm. you know, it, it has never been. Uh, Julian is accused under the Espionage Act. So this is this is a piece of legislation that was brought in during the First World War, and never before has it been used against a publisher. Um, it's never been used uh, or interpreted in this uh, bizarre way basically relabels journalism as espionage. Uh, there's no allegation that Julian was acting on behalf of another power or anything like that. Uh, the indictment insel itself says that, you know, he received it from the material from Chelsea Manning and he published it for the public, uh, not for anyone else's benefit. Uh, and there's no question about how important this material wa was. It revealed war crimes and torture and so on. Uh, so, uh, the, the, when when the law is used in an uh, previously uh, 
in an unprecedented manner, in a way that has previously never been done before, in such a heavy-handed manner. I mean, he's facing 18 charges, 175 years in prison. Um, then that's a obvious um, indication that what you're what you're seeing here is a weaponization of the law to suit certain political goals, which is basically to silence Julian, but to also silence journalists and to keep the public ignorant. Let me uh, ask you a question. In the best case scenario, in your best case scenario, if Julian was released, do you think he'd ever be truly safe? You know, you've mentioned before, uh, the, you know, the CIA under Mike Pompeo and what have you, there will be, I'm guessing, many Americans who would see Julian as a traitor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think he'd ever be truly safe if he, if, if, if when he is free? Well, um, I don't know that Julian will ever be truly safe, but um, there is a political persecution um, that has to stop. Uh, there are protections that should uh, be ki kicking in. Um, Julian exercised his right uh, to publish, to freedom of expression. These are protected rights um, within ju this jurisdiction, and uh, he should be protected from a state taking uh legal measures to silence him and imprison him uh the there should also be protections from you know extra extra judicial uh means of assassination and so on um but there would be a very strong signal if the court said actually enough is enough um this mm. man should not be suffering anymore he's been in prison for 5 years this case against him is uh is unprecedented and uh you know strange and and politically charged and let him just be free that would be protective I, that, it, I mean that's probably never going to happen in the event of that not happening i mean courts aren't in the uh, you know it would be very unusual for a court to be able to to admit that you know for a state if you like to admit that it would be in america admitting that you surely he would always be looking over his shoulder um, you know, it, it, if and when he's free. I mean, it, it's a scary scenario. Being here in the States, you see some of the, uh, what can I call them, so, you know, some of the rhetoric, um, uh, the, uh, if I can talk about the far right as well. Um, it would be scary, surely. Well, the, the scariest prospect is the one that we have right now. Uh, where he is yeah. indefinitely imprisoned, where his health is deteriorating, um, where he is risking uh, imminent extradition, really, because the, he's just one step away from extradition. Um, and this just has to stop. If he's free, uh, you know, we can take measures to protect him, of course. Mm. Uh, but right now he's in a very precarious situation where his health is is in decline and that in itself is is perhaps the greatest risk when you when you say his health is in decline are we talking about physical and mental health yes i'm talking about both um but you know i'm he's he's 52 now i mean he's been in a prison cell for five years he isn't getting um the type of exercise or n nutrition that he needs um when you keep a person in those conditions, of course, uh, they will deteriorate. And I, I'm extremely worried about him. And he's already had health episodes. He had a minor stroke in October 2022. Um, he's on medication and he just should not be suffering like this. Um, he's, you know, his, his body can only take so much. I, I, you know, we're talking about his body, but I come back to kind of where we started off how he deals, how he deals. Well, I mean, this is day after day after day. Um, you know, how I'm trying to put my head inside his. How does he deal with it? I mean, you know, for all the words in the world, when you're sitting there and your fate, uh, your life, I mean, we have one, but one life to live. Your life is in the hands of people outside. You can talk to your children and your wife on the phone, but then you must get a certain kind of, I call it skin hunger. You know, I mean, any dad doesn't think twice about being able to cuddle his wife or his children. 
how the hell do you deal with that? How does he deal with that day after day after day? Well, it's difficult to answer that question because it changes from day to day. Some days are extremely difficult and it's hard to um, know what to say to to get him, you know, to, to see, uh, to feel optimistic uh, mm-hmm. about the possibilities of the future. And then other days he, he brightens up. So it really changes from day to day. And there have been weeks that have been very dark um, yeah. periods where he's been, you know, unrecognizable and and sleep deprived and really really deeply in a dark place uh but uh he's also struggling what do you what do you, yeah. what do you <laughs> say to him when he's like that i mean you're his probably his biggest cheerleader but what do you say to him when he's in those dark days well i try to keep him connected to the day to day uh, I try to keep him connected to to the reality outside because uh, if it becomes too much about the, those prison walls, um, then it, it's easy to get lost. Um, so yeah. even mundane things um, are important to connect him to. And I describe what I see if I'm walking in a park when he calls. Uh, you know, I, I describe small things to, to make him imagine um, what it's like outside the prison. Yeah, yeah, it must be really, really tough on him, on you, and on your children, um, I, which is why I'm doubly, trebly uh, grateful for you uh, speaking with us today and just reminding people of the humanity behind all of this. You know, we, we see the headlines and forget there's an actual human being, a dad with a family uh, and with a wife. So I do thank you for, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, Stella Assange there uh, talking about her husband, Julian Assange, and it will be in May that we uh, find out about uh, the US uh, extradition, whether it's been successful or not. And as you heard Joseph Kotri monson saying before, uh, it's yet another step in a very long, sad and sorry so. Uh, coming up after the break, we'll be talking to Neelesh, our dentist, and a growing industry uh, trying to convince young women to freeze their eggs. But at what cost and what actual success? Uh, and don't forget, you can get in touch with us about anything we've talked about today. I'll remind you of the number right after the break. So uh, stay with us here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk. Welcome back. Well, at the end of the last hour, I put the number up on the screen. It was up like two seconds, so let's do it again. Um, if you want to talk about anything, you don't have to agree with me. My husband's just sent me a text said, tell, it, tell people they don't have to agree with what you say. I, I, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I'm disagreeing with what he's saying already. 0344 499 1000. You can text the word talk to 87222 or x at talk TV because we've got lots to talk about in this following hour. It's World Health Day, so I'm just about to discuss that. Uh, Dr. Neelish Palmer is going to be hot footing it into our studio because there's a, a new uh, alert out on health conditions that can arise after you've had a root canal or something really deeply invasive in the uh, dentist chair. Plus, there is an... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and use the word industry. There's an industry uh, aimed at getting young women to freeze their eggs. Now, number one, it's really expensive. And number two, the success rates might not be as advertised, if you, if you uh, know what I'm saying. Uh, the whole push of it is that, hey, young women, you know, carry on, have your career. You don't have to hustle it to get pregnant. We will freeze your eggs. And when you're in your 30s or late 30s or 40s, um, uh, you, you know, hey, presto, you can still have a baby when otherwise you might not have been able to. Mm, yeah, as I said, it's an industry. It's an industry. Exploiting young women who have a fear of being infertile. We'll be talking about that a little bit later with a journalist who's done excellent expose on that quote unquote industry. But 03444991000, you can text the word talk to 87222. You can exit Talk TV. You can get involved. You don't have to agree with me. So my husband's probably ringing it right now. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about world health day um it is today this year's theme was chosen to champion the right of everyone everywhere to have access to quality health services education information as well as safe drinking water clean air good nutrition quality housing decent working and environmental conditions and freedom from discrimination uh i, I had a quick google what percentage of the uk population has a health Problem. This is what it told me. Almost half of the UK population, 45.7% uh, of men, 50.1% uh, of women reported having a long-standing health problem. Is that you? 
More women, 22.3%, reported being limited but not severely, so in activities because of a health problem in the last uh, six months than men. That's 18.5%. Uh, but when you look at the fact that there was a peak of, uh, what there's over, what, 2.8 million people not working because of long-term sickness, um, World Health Day has come at a very good time for us to discuss this. Joining me now is Dr. Sarah Steele, who's a senior lecturer, uh, a researcher, consultant, educator at the University of Essex and University of Cambridge. And uh, Dr. Sarah Steele joins me now. Sarah, uh, happy World World Health Day. Um, let's uh, when we talk about health. Uh, it seems to me we often neglect the area of public health. Um, I, you know, I, I hadn't even considered the issues around public health until I was uh, elected to a board in Australia, the Public Health Board of Australia to represent mental health. And then I began to see how housing, employment, discrimination, all of those things feed into whether a person is of good health or not. So let me throw this at you. With all of these reports coming out, what are the major factors um, that are barriers to good health in the UK today, this World Health Day? Well, I think the big thing, Tricia, is just to say that life expectancy is stalling and health inequalities are widening in England. And that's not just down to health care and our health care system. That actually comes down to a huge number of things like the state of the economy and work, housing. It comes down to the foods we're eating, the rise of chronic disease is highly tied to our dietary intakes, our physical activity, our ability to live good, healthy lives, air quality, all of these things impact our general health. And obviously, as we know in this kind of post-pandemic period, our mental health matters so much as well. As you say, that kind of mental health element to this is critical. And so while people are also living a little bit longer, we have seen stalls around that, as I said, they are also living longer with major health conditions and major mental health conditions. So there's a number of key risk factors, key lifestyle factors, key social and economic factors that are driving a significant and unequal burden around preventable ill health and certainly premature death in the UK and elsewhere. It must be frustrating to people like yourself to see governments, I'm not talking about any particular party, but governments around the world are often not linking those things together. I mean, uh, to me, a health department should have someone representing housing and, and education and all those things. Um, health is still very much sort of in one little narrow corner if you say to any any member of the british public how's your health eventually we'll be discussing the national health service we probably won't be discussing uh you know water which is a big issue in the uk um you know we won't be discussing as you said additives in food or pollution or things like that it must be really frustrating to see the fragmentation of what should be a decent conversation around health i think absolutely it is and there's those building blocks of good health that we've kind of mentioned and alluded to here are just so unevenly distributed across the population and the real-time cuts that we've seen here in the UK and elsewhere around public services over the past decade and then over the course of the pandemic, it means that some of those building blocks are really missing for all too many people, which is incredibly frustrating. And at the end of the day, things like affordable quality housing, um, the rates of people who are in work but in poverty in countries like the UK, those sorts of things are all really things that we're going to have to address if we want healthy, happy populations. And I think those working in the public health workforce know this. We know the social determinants of health. We teach it. We talk about it publicly. We do so much around it. But the sharp increase in the costs of living that we're currently experiencing that have really happened since 2021 have increased alongside that stress and anxiety, even for the public health workforce itself. And so there's just so many people 
even those in work in the health service who are unable to afford those essentials that they need to maintain their own health. And those pressures you talked about in the NHS have real impacts, not just on the population we're serving, but the NHS and social care. Those who work in it are burning out. Those who work in it are stressed. They aren't able to keep up with the expense of living in some of the UK's big cities where the prices and the rental market are just unattainable yeah. to some people. And so I think there is a huge amount of frustration. We've known this, we've had data for a really long time. We know what we need to do. Now we just need to do it. So, okay, let me throw this at you. If uh, the public health sector uh, were suddenly elected to government, you know, no, no particular political party, what are the, some of the basic things that you would tackle in order to put things on the right path? So I think we need to really address that concerted policy action and the investment that needs to go with it. Whoever is in government at the next election are going to, for a fact, inherit a healthcare system that is frankly in crisis. The NHS mm -hmm. is under extreme strain and many people are going without the care they need. And so there's some really obvious things that we can address, like addressing general practice and making sure that we're doing good preventative health care. I think there's uh, some yes. really important things about mental oh, health yes. and social care. And so I think no, I, everywhere. I, 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 sorry, sorry, I, I know I interrupted you. I know, oh, yes, the words came out. One of the things that I, I'll stick my neck out here and say, one of the things, and I, as I said before, I was involved in uh, as a government advisor in Australia on mental health and ended up working in public health. And one of the things we, you know, preventative health, it's that, I never forget that phrase, building a fence at the top of the cliff rather than having to fund ambulances at the bottom. Britain, like many in many countries, is not very good at preventative health and seeing the cost benefits of preventative health, is it? No, and I think it's especially bad at knowing that particularly people living in the most deprived areas of this country, really early interventions at the earliest possible points in life, getting good child and maternal health, setting people up front, in their course of education throughout that kind of life course will make real differences in health. And actually with all those building blocks of health, having experienced some real stalls, if not backwards trends, the difference between richer and poorer areas of the UK mean that we really need to attend to health inequalities. And, and that's kind of the thing about rights here. We need to be doing that as part of World Health Day, obviously is paying attention to the the very worst off in the UK are experiencing much higher levels of chronic illness and all these things. And they're largely preventable. If we have mm -hmm. access to good, healthy food, we encourage good dietary intake. We ensure households have access to good quality housing, fuel during the winter months, especially those kind of things. We can set kids up for healthy futures. We can count the oldest in the UK in the best health that we can and we can ensure that there's greater health equity and that those pressures that we see every winter on the NHS, that those kind of pressures we're seeing on social care, if we can really front end this, we can attend to some of that before it even hits the NHS and hopefully then resource the healthcare system and the health service to do better work at the back end because it's freed up of so much more of that pressure. So really understanding the range of changes facing us that we need to make coming into an election year here and in other countries that face similar things. It's really mm. that action is needed by policymakers in the education setting, the social settings, in housing, in the quality of our outdoor environments, our air quality, our water quality, all of those things. We're having the right conversations, but we need to be taking action and preventing is better than trying to respond at the health service level just at the end gate. Thank you so much. So brilliantly said. And I do thank you for your, your time today, this World Health Day. Dr. Sarah Steele, uh, researcher, consultant, educator at the University of Essex and University of Cambridge. Uh, coming up, we talk about the, the new business of getting women to freeze their eggs. Dr. Neelish Palmer will be joining us. And we've managed to get Dr. Veronica Bray, who is a research sci uh, scientist at the Lunar and Planet 
planetary lab in, I'm reading this as it comes up, Arizona, because we only just got her. She's going to be talking about the comet coming over America tomorrow. There's a number on the screen if you want to have a say about anything. How is your health? 03444991000. You can text the word talk to 87222 or x at talk TV. Back with more in a moment. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. I'm such a goose. I said a comet. It's not a comet. It's an eclipse. Got to remember, total eclipse. Da, da, da. Um, yes, we've got um, Dr. Veronica Bray coming up uh, later. She's a research scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in Arizona. The question is, will you be able to see the eclipse uh, effects in the UK? We are due to see it in the US and there's a huge tourist industry around it. Talking of industries, um, this this I think this is a really surprising one. A uh, little more than a decade ago, freezing eggs was still experimental, uh, reserved mainly for women with serious medical conditions. But all that has changed thanks to a change in UK law. It was made in 2022, which means that eggs can be stored for 55 years. Uh, that's up from the previous limit of 10 years. I guess, making it a realistic insurance policy, quote unquote, for women in their 20s, anxious about one day becoming a mother. That anxiety, however, has been fueled by social media ads, people like Made in Chelsea star Sophie Herman excitedly documenting freezing her eggs. Uh, but number one, it's very expensive. And number two, 
what are the success rates? Uh, joining me now is Joe Crawford, who's a Times radio uh, reporter who's been delving into the world of this new, uh, let's call it, let's call it an industry. Joe, thank you for joining me. Um, it does seem to be a bit of an industry. Let's talk about first the cost and how sure one is if one gets one's eggs uh, frozen that it will be a success yeah so in terms of cost you're looking at upwards of seven thousand pounds i spoke to one woman who'd actually spent nearly forty thousand pounds on having her eggs frozen but she had medical complications so as you can see it's a lot of money but in terms of success rates what we're talking about is how likely are you able to have a baby from these frozen eggs and according to the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, they're the UK fertility regulator, the average success rate is 18%. But Ooh. that really depends on two things for an individual. For example, a woman's age really impacts her success rate. So the older you get, the quality and the quantity of your eggs naturally depletes. So for example, if you're in your late 30s or 40s, you could be looking at a success rate of just 3%. Oh, gosh. Now, I mentioned before that, uh, you know, and I keep using the word industry or business, if you like, uh, social media has become a tool for advertising all of this, hasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And that's sort of what kickstarted this investigation for me, because my Instagram feed was just full of these adverts. And I could also see on TikTok, there were a lot of influencers, not just in the UK, in America, Australia, who were talking about their experiences with um egg freezing and I actually reached out to one influencer in the UK who'd done a collaboration with an egg freezing clinic and a collaboration a collaborate I mean yeah. you think of collaboration with like handbags or cars so they had done a collaboration so what they probably got a freebie or a reduced price or something like that I, I did ask if they paid the full amount but they didn't want to comment on that um but yeah, they were, were promoting it. But again, you know, these it, this is a very expensive procedure and with success rates of on average 18%, you know, is it worth that potentially 7,000, if not more, that you're going to spend on it? Is it worth that price? So it, as you say, your your feed was bombarded. You know, you, you saw all of these. So mm. uh, obviously they're aiming at young what young professional women who might be juggling with that age old question of will I be too old or families mm. or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what, so, so influencers and ads on, on TikTok are all across those platforms. Yeah, well, I saw it across quite a few platforms and it does sort of link back to the fact that in 2021, the 10-year limit on freezing your eggs, that was lifted. So now you can freeze your eggs up to 55 years. And I spoke to a women's health lecturer um, and researcher who told me that, you know, this is sort of like a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it gives women more choice. But then mm -hmm. on the other hand, this means that clinics can potentially now advertise to younger and younger women because, for example, when you had that 10-year limit, a woman who was 20 probably didn't want to, you know, get it done at 20 because she didn't be able to keep it till she's 30. Whereas now, you know, she could keep her eggs up to 55 years. Now, we're saying quite flippantly, we've said the phrase, freeze your eggs, but it's actually a quite a gruelling process, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, I, I spoke to two women who'd undergone the procedures themselves and you have to take hormones for it um, and it can, you know, for example, there's risks of hyper ovarian stimulation, um, you know, women were experiencing extremely bad bloating and stomach pain as a result, um, you know, it was very much down to the like individual's experience, but you can definitely have some side effects as a result. And uh, you, uh, am I right in thinking that actually, you know, the, uh, how do they extract the eggs? I mean, you know, <laughs> let's talk about that. That might be a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty challenging procedure. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, you know, it's very similar with the process for IVF in terms of the fact that the woman, she has to take hormones for at least a month in order for her follicles to stimulate the growth of these eggs. Um, and then they're then extracted through procedure and then they're then frozen. 
And after that, when you want to potentially thaw the eggs to have a child, you then go through the process of IVF or creating the embryo from there. And of course, all the stress is involved with that. Uh, I, I was just having a look at the figures. More than 4,200 women froze their eggs in 2021. And, uh, you know, if you think, oh, that's not many, it was up from 2,500 in 2019 and only 400 in 2011. But mm. the majority never returned to unfreeze their eggs. And for those who do, as you say, uh, about one in five treatment cycles re actually result in a baby. So many of these women, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, the fear is drummed up. They fork out, as you say, four thousand pounds or uh you know that uh, could be upward from that to have their eggs frozen uh, and then they don't return for them mm. and yeah i think that's a thing we're, we're seeing at a moment uh, a big rise in the number of women doing social egg freezing so they're doing it for non-medical reasons they say that they want to do it because it's a safety net for their fertility or they're trying to preserve their fertility but as you said you know we still don't actually know for a lot of these women who have had the process vast majority of them haven't even got their eggs thawed yet or tried to have a baby from those eggs so we're still very much in the unknown in terms of that and that's going to be interesting for the future isn't it if if these companies are drumming up business online um women are freezing their eggs and not coming back for them surely somewhere down the line there's going to be an ethical question of whether they destroy those eggs or give them to someone else is there a cost as well for i i'm just you know thinking every year you have them frozen or what have you or once you've paid your money up front that's it they'll be frozen forever no, so you do have to pay a yearly cost. So I think it's around 300, 400 pounds that you'd have to pay to keep your eggs to be frozen. Um, one woman I spoke to, she was only able to extract two eggs, um, which basically gives her a very, very low chance of potentially having a baby as a result. But she still has to pay that 300 pounds per year to keep those eggs frozen. And it's the same, you know, if you get 20 eggs, if you get two eggs, you have to pay the same amount. And uh, uh, just a, a final question, are there, uh, I mean, is it a heavily regulated area? I mean, we've got the UK fertility regulator and, you know, they've got things like that. But we saw a recent investigation that was done by the BBC and they found that online for these clinics, it's around 41% of sites didn't make clear the success rates of their egg freezing, which could potentially breach advertising guidance. So the answer is be very, very careful. I mean, I guess uh, fear sells, doesn't it? I mean, that, that, that's basically what this is. If you're online mm. and, you know, you on social media, you're frightening women into, um, you know, coming to you and spending a, a, a lot of money. So I guess the answer would be, you know, think very, very carefully. Uh, it's not the easy, quick procedure that you think it is. And it's certainly not inexpensive. I'm gobsmacked by the amount of money that it costs mm. yeah and i mean for some women for example who do have medical conditions like endometriosis yeah. getting egg freezing you know that's a very important yeah. procedure but for example if you're a woman in your 20s who doesn't have a medical condition impacting your fertility it's probably quite unlikely that you will need to resort to assisted reproduction mm. Yeah, so again, don't always believe the hype. Thank you so much. Brilliant work that you've uh, done there. Um, an interesting one, Jo Crawford there. She's a Times radio reporter and she's been looking into the booming business, if I can call it that, of uh, fertility clinics. We'll be back with more after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. 
is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. Well, my next guest is a regular on the show, very popular indeed. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have him back, albeit to talk about something that when I read about it, I thought it a, a little bit scary. Uh, apparently, uh, if you're having a, a, a dental procedure, a very deep dental procedure, um, root canal or something, or what have you, uh, there's been an alert put out. Uh, it's about ineffective endocarditis. It's a potentially fatal inflammation of your heart valves and, and what have you. Uh, this occurs when germs, usually bacteria from somewhere else in your body, enter your bloodstream. And apparently, this is something that can happen when you are at the dentist. So cue my next guest, Dr. Neelish Palmer, dental surgeon extraordinaire. Neelish, should, should we be worried about this? What is it? How does it happen? Tell us all. Hi, Tricia. Thanks for having me back on the show. Great to see you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a concerning um, statistic, isn't it? So infective endocarditis is a very serious infection of the heart lining and the heart valves. Um, right. Now, we know that people are more prone to it if they've had artificial heart valves placed, if they've had it before, right. or if they've had a congenital heart defect. So your average healthy person isn't at risk. So that, that's the first thing that I would say. Okay. 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 Now, um, to explain it um, quickly and easily, it's that whenever you brush your teeth or whenever you have dental treatment done, the bacteria in your mouth can get into the bloodstream because if your gums bleed, the bacteria can get into the bloodstream from that. Right. And the risk is those bacteria can also go around the bloodstream and infect the heart. And if you have a patient whose heart is a bit impaired or the immune system is impaired, or if they have an artificial heart valve which where the, the blood flows in a slightly different way, that can increase their risk of the heart valve or the heart lining getting infected. Now, as... Oh. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Because yeah. you, you said even if you brush your teeth or floss. Yes. I'm thinking, yes. so what yes. the hell do you do then? 
it's difficult, isn't it? It's, it's a catch-22 situation. The first thing is to make sure that your mouth and your oral hygiene and everything is really, really healthy so the, the nasty bacteria in your mouth are limited. Um, right. But now, if you have an artificial heart valve, in the rest of the world, so in America, in Europe, etc., the dentist would give you a big dose of penicillin, usually amoxicillin, about an hour before you have the treatment done. So that uh -huh. antibiotic is in your bloodstream. So when the bugs get into the bloodstream, the antibiotic is there fighting the bacteria. It's sitting around the heart, so it helps reduce the risk of you developing infective endocarditis. So that's what we used to do. And if memory serves me correctly, in 2008, there was a guidance published in the UK by the organization known as NICE, National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And they said, right, the data to give antibiotics um, to reduce the risk of this infective endocarditis isn't good enough. We think there's more risk of a side effect from the antibiotics. We think that we are encouraging the um, growth of superbugs who become resistant to antibiotics. So we think um, we shouldn't be giving our antibiotic prophylaxis for these patients. And at the time, um, it was believed that that was the right thing to do. Now, why this has come up in the news is this year, um, right. one of the American journals, and um, I think there was a European journal, said that we now believe that we do need to give antibiotic prophylaxis because the data, they've had 10 years worth of data, you see, so they've been looking yeah, at yeah. the data. So now they're saying, right, um, we need to give antibiotic prophylaxis. So what we're waiting for is for NICE to update its guidance and say, dentists, please start dishing out the antibiotics to patients. At the moment, the guidance which dentists have to follow, it has a, it has a, a vague term which says, the antibiotic prophylaxis shouldn't be given routinely for dental procedures. Right. right. So what does that mean as a dentist? Mm. Do, do mm -hmm. I give it or do I not give it? So yeah. for, for my work, which you know is a bit more invasive because my work is all surgery and implants and people, yeah. you know, they're, yeah. they're scared to come and see me because my stuff is a bit more gory. Um, we, we just speak to the cardiologist. So if a patient is at risk of this, we talk to the cardiologist and say, look, this is your patient, this is our patient. Do you want me to give antibiotic prophylaxis? And nine times out of 10, the cardiologist says, yes, give it. Oh. Um, and if the cardiologist says, give the antibiotics, then we would give the antibiotics. But what I think will happen now, or what I hope will happen, is that NICE will look at the data and they will say, okay, fine, now we need to give routine prophylaxis. The interesting thing, Tricia, is, the number of cases of infective endocarditis in the UK has gone up to quite a lot. So Whoa. I think it's gone up by, I think it's about 2,000 cases a year, maybe, wow. maybe more. Um, and it, it's, ser it's serious, isn't it? You end up in hospital, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's serious. Yeah, the, the mortality rate is high. It's 30%, I think, for it. But um, just, just to reassure your listeners, it's <laughs> patients who are high risk. At it. Your average healthy patient who has no issues, can come and see the dentist, can have all sorts of stuff done, can brush their teeth, and they're not at risk of infective endocarditis. Only patients that have got uh, prosthetic heart valve or congenital heart defects. So those are the patients that we're concerned about. Now, uh, the, the next subject I had, Dan, was to talk about the oral side effects of medication. Yes. And I, th I I didn't think so at first, but there is a flow on from this. Um, I, I'm using my own example here. But having undergone you know, four and a half months of weekly chemotherapy, and now I have infusions, I go into hospital every three weeks for yeah. infusions and uh, all sorts of other medications too boring to talk about. But my dentist, if I have, um, you know, if I'm going to have deep work and trust me, chemotherapy wrecks your teeth completely. Um, I uh, he has to know about that. There's certain procedures I can't have at certain times. Mm. Now, considering now, let's talk about cancer as uh, one of the many chronic diseases. There are many chronic diseases, aren't there? Where when you go to the dentist, you should say right up front if your dentist doesn't know, because it has implications about procedures you can and can't have at certain times, doesn't it? Yeah, very, very true, Tricia. Um, so chemotherapy, number one. Um, so if there's there's so many oral side effects to treatments and medications, and I thought mm. we'd we'd put them into three different types. So the first one right. is dry mouth, and we call it xerostomia. 
Um, and it is common in chemotherapy patients. It's common in patients on antidepressants, anticonvulsants, um, certain types of antibiotics. So what that does, it stops your salivary glands from producing a lot of saliva. Now, right. saliva is very important to reduce the risk of tooth decay because it has antibacterial properties. It helps you to eat comfortably because it lubricates the food and makes it easier for you to chew. Um, and it also helps reduce um, bad breath as well. Now, xerostomia um, is very common amongst the elderly as well because you find that because we're living for longer, you see yeah. patients, especially some of my older patients, they come with a massive list of drugs. It used to just be one or two, and now they come up with about 20, you see. And I'm looking through them thinking, crikey, it's good for, good job my best friend is a pharmacist, so I can just message her and say, excuse me, what, what does this do, this What's funny this? name thing? <laughs> so, and a lot of them have, they develop decay on the edges of the teeth, so just where the tooth comes out of the gum, and we call that root caries, and that's very common if you have dry mouth. Now, there are things we can do for dry mouth, so that's um, chewing um, sugar-free gum, because that initiates the yeah. salivary production, and speaking to your GP and saying, look, this medication I'm on for, let's say, high blood pressure, is giving me dry mouth. Can we change it to an alternative? So there are things we can do for that. So that's, that's dry mouth. The, the other one that I wanted to mention, um, which is also common in um, chemotherapy patients and patients on immunosuppressant medication, is overgrowth of the gums. So the gums grow over mm. the teeth, and we call it gingival hyperplasia. We see that quite a lot in patients on immunosuppressant medications. And the problem with that is that because the gums overgrow, they become very sensitive, they bleed very quickly, and the little nooks and crannies in the gums become deeper, so you can develop gum disease, and you can lose teeth quite quickly with those. So that's also something that we need to keep an eye on. And the last one, is um, oral thrush or um, oral candidiasis. So that's a fungal infection of the mouth. Again, patients on chemotherapy, patients on asthma inhalers, where they have the asthma pump. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. when you pump the asthma inhaler, the um, steroid goes right to the roof of the mouth. And right. it disperses everywhere else. But because it goes right to the roof, roof of the mouth, it gets absorbed. But that little area, because it has the steroid around it, the immune response, so the immune system is a bit impaired there. And that's when fungus can get in. And it looks as oh, little yeah. white dots on the roof of the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. see that in older patients who wear dentures, because um, one of my master's theses was actually trying to figure out how do you properly disinfect a denture from fungus? And it's really hard to do it. The only way to really do it is to boil the denture or put it in a microwave, and that obviously ruins the denture. And that's why we say, these patients who come and see me have had the same denture for about 5, 10, 15. I've seen a woman had a denture for 25 years, the same denture. It's got so many bugs in it. Each time you take it out, the mouth recovers, you put it back in and it gets reinfected all the bacteria. Yeah. So you find with denture wearers, they can sometimes get oral candidiasis, it's a fungal infection in the roof of the mouth. Again, patients with immunosuppressant diseases, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, they can get that too. And there are medications that we can give you for that. There's a nice lozenge that we can give you. It tastes absolutely horrible, but it's very <laughs> good. Nothing in dentistry tastes nice. Like all the stuff we give you, everything is designed to taste bad. Um, but that's really good for fighting off that. So I think, I think the main method is, um, or the main take home message is good oral hygiene, good brushing, regular visits to the dentist and the hygienist who are totally trained to see these things. So that if, you're, if something happens to you later on in life, and mm -hmm. you unfortunately have to go through chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or you have to um, get put on certain types of medication. If you approach it with a mouth that is already healthy, you're going to do yeah. better in the future. So it's prevention ah. is the key. Yes, and we were just talking on World Health Day about prevention yeah. being the key. So that's a brilliant point to, to make an end on. Nilosh, Nilesh, I love talking with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming into our studio. And I love the glasses, the glasses as Thank well. Thank you, Trisha. I'm trying, to keep, I'm trying to keep up with you because you have different glasses each time I speak I know, to you. I know. I got a pack of six for $27. <laughs> beat that. Uh, Dr. Nilesh Palmer there, dental surgeon, uh, with a very, uh, very, very important message. Um, so let me tell you what's coming up next. I'm so excited because tomorrow there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun over here in the United States. There's a huge tourist industry around it. Everybody's talking about it. You've got certain politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene saying it's a sign from God. But 
will it be able to be seen in the UK or anywhere else apart from North America? Well, Dr. Veronica Bray, I'm so excited about this, is a research scientist at the Luna and uh, Planetary Laboratory in Arizona. Let me give you a little bit of background about her. Apparently, Veronica knew from the age of six that she wanted to work in space, inspired by the Voyager 2 mission. She's now a highly respected comparative planetologist. I hope I got that right. And a planetary scientist who was amongst the first people to see Pluto up close. Um, so I'm just waiting for her to, 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 to get ready to talk to us about this uh, total eclipse of the sun. For instance, how long will it last? What will we see? And I actually understand that under certain circumstances, when you look up and how what what protections you should take when you're looking up at the sun. Uh, but in certain circumstances, apparently the clouds disappear or seem to disappear from the sky when this total eclipse happens. Um, so I've got lots of things to, to ask. And we managed to get her at the last moment. So I'm just hoping and we still. She's almost ready, like the like the total eclipse. Um, I don't know. Do you believe it's a sign from God? That's what Marjorie Taylor uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor uh, Green said. There's a number on the screen: oh three double four four nine nine one thousand. Is it God telling us to repent? Uh, you can text the word "talk" to eight seven triple two. Tweet at Talk TV. Um, yeah. So, uh, as I said, and uh, if you remember. When we talk to Simon, uh, and I've forgotten his name. Oh, hang on. The moon isn't the only thing that will behave differently during the April 8th solar eclipse. Uh, millions of Americans will observe, observe the solar phenomenon and lots of, lots of animals will also feel the effect. Um, the U.S. Sun spoke with one NASA expert who revealed that animals will behave differently once the sun uh, dims. Uh, that's going to be an interesting one uh, because what do they do? Do they howl or what have you? Uh, animals behave difficult, differently. They might be confused. <laughs> Many of them might think it's the night. Come around for a second feed. I do believe she's ready. Dr. Veronica Bray, as I said, is a research scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in Arizona. Uh, Veronica, thank you so much for, for joining me. This eclipse has got us all very excited, I have to say. How long will it last? Uh, where will it be seen? And most importantly, how should we look at it if, if we can see it? Um, if you are close to the line of totality, so the, the maximum point where the shadow of the moon is cast on the Earth, you'll get about four minutes of totality. And so that means the moon is fully in front of the sun and you'll be able to see the sun's corona kind of shining out on all sides. As you move further away from that line, you'll have three minutes, two minutes, down to just a few. Um, it's the great American uh, eclipse. And so it's, it's special because it covers so many American states. Um, you will also get a little bit of it in the UK, uh, around seven to eight o'clock at night. Um, not very much, just a partial. Um, right. and it doesn't like England, but, uh, Scotland, Ireland and Wales will get a little bit of this. <laughs> is it true that under certain circumstances the clouds disappear do they seem to disappear or do they actually disappear um so i i was unlucky enough to go to a total solar eclipse in england a few years back and we had cloud at the time of totality so i never saw it but what i did see was the amazing environment around me everything went gray um the clouds and the land all kind of looked the same color to me. So even if you have bad weather, as a lot of the US is expected to have, you'll still be able to look around you um, and listen to the the birds stop stop singing. Okay. And nature nature feels very confused. And it's very eerie. Yes, because uh, one uh, there was one report that animals behave differently or might behave differently. 
Um, I haven't seen that myself, but I know that it is a thing. Like every, all of the animals assume that night has suddenly come, and so that you'll get, you'll get their evening routines suddenly spring into effect. It's most noticeable with the birds, I think, because you can you can hear that whether you can see them or not. And let's talk about if you are lucky to be, uh, uh, you know, in America or bits of England. What precautions should you take with your eyes? I mean, is it overstated or is there a genuine risk if you just stare up at it? It's not an overstated risk. It is extremely dangerous, permanently eye damaging to view the sun when it's not at complete totality. Um, so get yourself some solar viewers, um, make sure they're not scratched on the surface. And right. up until the point of totality, you'll need to look through your solar viewers. Um, and then at the point of totality, you can chance that, you know, looking at the sun. Wow, I, I so like I, I like the videos that are showing next to us, showing the, the leaf patterns. And there's other other ways of viewing the eclipse that aren't looking directly up, you know, being able to use a pinhole camera. So just a piece of paper with a hole in it and letting that shine onto another piece of paper or the ground, you'll be able to view the partial eclipse quite safely doing that. Wow. So how often does this happen? Uh, a total solar eclipse happens about every 18 months. However, it usually happens over the ocean. Um, so we don't usually get a nice time with it on land where it passes over many urban areas that it can actually be enjoyed by humans. Um, and so the, the next great American eclipse will be in the 2040s. Wow. Wow. A long time. That makes yeah. And so uh, here's the other thing. Now, you're a research scientist. So do you do a lot of research around or is there research around uh, eclipses? Oh, yes, there's uh, there's extra information that we can get from different eclipses, not just the moon and the sun. Uh, for example, if the moon had an atmosphere when it passed in front of the sun, the passage of the sunlight through that atmosphere would give us data about what what that atmosphere contains. And so if you're looking at extrasolar planets, planets around other stars, you might be able to find out about their their atmospheres. Wow. Right now, excuse me for asking, because I, I can hear you've got an accent. I'm trying to work out where you're from, but you're in Arizona. How did you, where, where are you from and how did you end up there? I, I'm from uh, from London area, Harrow, uh, Pinner specifically, and then I uh, did my undergraduate at University College London, PhD at Imperial College, and then came over to the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, um, where I'm, I'm now a, a research professor. So it's difficult to reach a lovely sunny area and leave it, to be honest. <laughs> But, but what made you so interested that you've, you know, relocated to the USA? What was it that sparked your interest in, in the planets? It, it was extremely simple. It was when I was six and I noticed that um, Neptune, Neptune and Uranus were, they looked very similar, but they were completely different colours. And I just wanted to know why. Why was there that difference? And looking at crystals like why are they all of their different colors you know try and so it really was that simple why are there those differences oh wow there here you are in the united states uh so for people living in the us i, I suppose they're time differences but roughly over the uk what time rough time uh it, well they don't like england but in the other parts of the uk that might see uh some of the uh total eclipse what time rough time would should they be looking out for it um it's it's close to sunset so it's, it might be difficult viewing conditions you know there'll be trees in the way um but i think it's about seven or eight o'clock for the uk um right and then of course it, it takes a long time to travel across the for the moon shadow to travel across the united states so I know I've checked it out in Tucson. I'll be with uh, with a, a few school classes. We're going to be looking up at with solar viewers at um, 
about 10.30 our time. Oh, 11, 11.20 our time. Right. Oh, it's so exciting. A quick message here. Trisha, in some cultures, they believe that the solar eclipse uh, was a harbinger of things to come. Whether it's good or bad, it remains to be seen. Blood moon is often described as a harbinger of wars and bloodshed. Sadly, for human beings, we don't need things like total eclipses to, you know, to, to start wars and what have you. But it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you, and albeit at very late notice. Thank you for scrambling and getting things together. Very exciting time tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Veronica Bray, as I said, research scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in Arizona. Coming up, the Sunday Night Club with Mark Saggers. I've got a, a minute or so to talk to you about. <laughs> Uh, what you've got on your show, Mark? Well, I got no Apollo. I can tell you that, and <laughs> certainly no Dark Side of the Moon. Although I'd always love a bit of Pink Floyd on the show. Uh, but what yeah. we do have is we have some great guests tonight. We've got plenty of football. We've got the youngest ever football director in the Premier League, Jack Sullivan, will be joining us from West Ham United. Our middle hour is looking at exactly where this Premier League goes with what sort of punishments for clubs that financially don't get it right. And alongside that, we've got the cricket season starting, we've got the golf, we've got all sorts to come tonight, right the way through. And of course, fans from the clubs that matter on all of the big games today that have mattered too. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm loving the glasses. Oh, do you like them tonight? I, yeah, they're... I do. I think they're very funky. Yeah, good. Thank you. Well, I, I, I lose so many pairs of glasses that um, I just have a different pair every week sort of thing, really. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, you uh, probably do what I do. Put your glasses on your head and spend 20 minutes looking for them. Oh, I, I do, uh, you get to our, our, or my age, not your age, Trisha. It's the rule of four leaving no, the hang house. No, hang on, hang on. I'm probably older than you. No, How no. How old are you? No, I, I'm 64. Well, I'm older than you. I'm 66. Yeah, you don't look it. So, um, <laughs> anyway, the, the whole point of this uh, is really, you must get this, rule of four, wallet, keys, glasses, and phone. Yeah. And can I ever four all four, find all four together? No. No. Never. No. Ever. Because no. you're a man. Uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> and you've got a woman to go and look for no 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 uh, no definitely i've got a very very good woman but uh she certainly doesn't go looking for my keys she'd just leave me outside i can tell you that yeah i do the same to my husband as well <laughs> mark sangers there with the uh, sunday night club uh coming up um uh let me tell you i'm go i'm gonna say thanks to my team because I don't want to run out uh, of time because as usual they have done uh, to use a Mark Saggers uh, quote they've hit the ball out of the park with this weekend show. Uh, Island Loness has done incredible work as usual uh, working with me throughout the week to bring different stories to you and I think we've Pretty well done that today. Uh, Carla Battisti, she's in the studio.